So today is, good morning, today is, is this the 24th of Tevet, the day of passing of the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, and the, I believe, 17th of <laughs> January. I have to every day try to reconstruct what date we're at. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Okay, so let's see uh, this week's Parsha of Eira. The first verse is in Exodus 6, 2. And the second verse reads, And I revealed myself to Isaac, uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the name Kil Shakai. And my name, Havaya, I didn't reveal to them, or I didn't become known to them. And as we said yesterday, there's a lot of questions about this. How could it be? Because um, God did reveal himself as Havaya, the Yudke Vavke, the Tetragrammaton to the patriarchs. So what does this exactly mean? We gave uh, a different answer yesterday. Today we're going to go in a different direction, which is the main direction in which uh, Rev Ginsburg's thought about this verse goes, even though, there, again, he also has a few other directions. So the first thing to know is that Kel Shakai, which is written Aleph Lamed Shin Daled Yud, so Aleph Lamed Shin Daled Yud, Aleph Lamed is 31, and Shin Daled Yud is 314. So what does this uh, equal together? 31 plus 314, 345. And that's the value of Moshe. Moshe is Mem Shin Hei, 345. So, so there's a lot in Kabbalah about this, that the name Kel Shakai is a hint towards, it alludes to Moshe Rabbeinu. The question is, how is that related? That I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the name Moshe. It, this name Moshe is very important because it's not just the name that the daughter of Pharaoh gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. The same, same three letters, He Mem Shin, I believe that's the order. This I'm not a big, uh, I don't know much about, but in in there's something called the name of 72 letters. And the name of 72 letters is really 72 triplets of letters. Because it's composed out of the one of two times in the entire Torah that we have three verses that have the same number of letters consecu consecutively, one after the other. And that's in the in Parashat B'Shalach that we'll read in two weeks. So from that they constructed, the Kabbalists constructed what's called the name of the 72 letters. And one of these is Hei Mem Shin. And it's the same letters as Moshe. So it's a, it's a triplet in that name of 72. But it's also, when you just permute the letters simply of, hey, of Moshe, Mem Shin Hei, it's also Hashem. And that's the word that everyone uses to designate Havaya, to designate the Tertugramit. We call it the, the name. So it's Hashem. It's the same letters as Moshe. Same, same thing. So this name is very much, this number 345, all these have obviously the, the va same value. 345 is very related to a certain re revelation of Hashem. Every name is a revelation. It's like what by the anthropologist or the, uh, or the historians they would call a mask of God. Uh, something Joseph Campbell coined, this idea that God has many masks. But we don't say masks, we say faces. He has many, many faces, and he shows himself in many ways. And specifically, the Medrash says that he shows himself based on how he acts. If he acts compassionately, he says, my name is Havaya, Yudke Vavke. If he acts with judgment, his name is Elohim. If he acts with loving kindness, his name is Aleph Lamed, Kel. But what does El Sh Kel Shakai mean? So Kel Shakai, yesterday we said it means that he limits himself. Specifically, this is brought in the Medrash in relation to the creation of the world. We mentioned this yesterday, that the world has by its nature a tendency to expand infinitely. Everything would expand infinitely. It's not like, like Einstein, it's just time and space. Einstein had this idea that from his equations, it turns out that the world would expand infinitely, and he had to introduce something he called the cosmological constant, which later in his life, he said, was the biggest uh, fiasco he did in, in physics. He, th he shouldn't have done that. If it says it expands infinitely, so it expands infinitely, and that's it. 
But, w but in the Medrash it says that it, it has the potential to expand infinitely everywhere, not just time and space, but also thought, and everything has the expansion. Why? Because God is infinite, so the world has a tendency to reflect God, so it wants to expand infinitely. So God had to limit it. <coughs> now how did he limit it? He used the name Kel Shakai. He says Kel Shakai is the name of limitation. So yesterday we took this in a certain direction. But here it's a completely different thing. It says, why, why did he only show them his name, Kel Shakai? He says here, because Rashi says, because he made them many promises and he didn't keep them. He didn't show them that he was keeping his promise. And yet they continued to believe in him. What was the promise? The promise, the main promise that he gave them was to give them the land of Canaan. But they didn't inherit the land of Canaan. When Abraham wanted to uh, bury Sarah, he had to buy a plot of land. Nobody would give him even like an empty, it's an empty field, that's all you need. So they had a very uh, difficult situation in which each one of them was promised by God that they would receive the land of Canaan. And they didn't receive it. But says God, but they, they never complained. And you, I promise you, I would take the Jewish people out through you. And at the first sign of trouble, you get upset. And so you're nothing like the patriarchs. That's like the, the simple meaning. The deeper meaning is that the fact that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to contain themselves in spite of the fact that they had promises. And they said it may, it may have to wait some generations. In fact, it waited seven generations from Abraham. The generation that came into the land of Israel was the seventh generation, at least in the Levites, it was seventh generation. By Ephraim, it was the 16, 15th generation. So it took a long, long time. But they held their breath. <laughs> they waited patiently. So Kel Shakai is understood as the name of patience also. It's not just limitation in the sense that God limited the world. It's also the name through which we get patience. And what is it related to? So it's related to the Sfira of Yesod, the foundation. And foundation means... First of all, where is it? So in the body, the foundation is the sexual organs and specifically the male sexual organ. So it says, what's the idea here? That a person has to have patience, he has to control it. Mm. The, the, what comes out of that, that he has control over it, again, each, each person has his struggles, whatever it is, but even the fact that he waits, a let's say, even, even when there's marital relations. So he has to struggle to contain it until it's the right moment. And he knows it's the right moment based on his wife. But again, it's not either to give birth or not. It's, it's to understand that I'm not here just to take my pleasure. I'm here to give pleasure. So I have to wait. So that's how the, the, uh, the patriarchs were. They said, it's true that God promised us and we want to take our pleasure. Our pleasure would be the fulfillment of our promise. But we're waiting. We'll wait. How long will it take? So they passed away. They, they, they died waiting. But the result of this name is Moshe Rabbeinu. It's like that by their waiting, they created the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. That the Kel Shakai, which equals Moshe, that's like the patience that they had. God revealed himself to them with the name Kel Shakai. Their patience was a revelation of godliness. And doing that for as long as they did, for three generations, that gave birth to a soul like Moshe Rabbeinu, who is the result of that patience. And then he could, he could bring everything to a culmination, everything to an... But even then it wasn't enough yet, because Moshe himself didn't go into the land of Israel. So he himself still had to exercise some patience. And that's also what God is sa saying to him here. Hold on. Why have you forgotten that your essence is this patience. So this is almost like the first lesson that he learns, that if he's going to want to lead the Jewish people, he has to have tremendous, tremendous patience. But the same thing is true by every person's family. Uh, a person is a king in his family. He's like a Moshe Rabbeinu in his family. He's the one who has to lead them into the future. So he has to have a lot of patience. A lot of patience with what? So the patriarchs, n another important thing to know about this name is, Another way to explain it is that it's patience in the fulfillment of myself. 
Why the fulfillment of myself? Because especially when you look at, at marital relations, the need to culminate, to finish, is like a need for self-fulfillment. That the person feels that this is all of me coming out. It's like the essence. That's why it gives su- such pleasure. It's like all my essence coming out. And he says, no, you, you have to have patience there. Also to wait until you're married, also to, and the, uh, when you're married, to have the, the right time. And even when you're together, there's also still patience exercised. So someone will come and say, uh, what do you need all this for? He says, because the world, even though the goal is self-fulfillment, but the self-fulfillment requires patience. How do we see this? Because we just said about the world, that when God created the world, he could have just said, okay, I'm going to create the world in its final state. But he tried that. The sages say that he tried all the different variations of the worlds. And he saw that that type of world where everything, where everything is, is, is instant, it's immediate. You want something, it's immediately fulfilled. That, that uh, doesn't, doesn't cause him any pleasure. It's really not pleasure. And that, w- that we see all the time, that if a person doesn't have patience, so the thing he can gain instantly is not his self-fulfillment. It's not really what he wanted. He goes away empty-handed. I missed the last point. That if a person immediately fulfills his desires, so he's really not content. Y- you see that from experience. How so? So th- there's... Uh, th- maybe the basis of life, but there was a fam- famous experiment that someone, I don't remember his name anymore, he did in the 50s of the cookie jar, or the, co- the plate with the cookies. It's a famous experiment in uh, psychology. He took children and he, and, he, and he filmed them in front of a, a plate of three cookies, or one cookie, I think. And he said to them, either you can have this cookie now, or you can wait 50 minutes and get two cookies. Yeah. So there was clear what the reward would be. So, so he just... He ticked off which children were able to wait for 15 minutes. And then he followed them for 50 years. And the was, results were unbelievable. That almost every single child who was able to wait, to be patient, to receive something higher, had a very, very successful life. And almost all the children who weren't able to wait, and they immediately took, you know, they fulfilled themselves right away. They, they took their desire right away. They had a very unsuccessful life. And so that's called the, that's the measure of Yesod, that's the power of Yesod, which on the one hand is self-fulfillment, it's this urge to receive my desire. On the other hand, the way that the Torah teaches it, is you have to learn how to contain it, how to be patient. It says, you will, d- in the end, the, the patriarchs received everything that, that was promised to them. Well, at least in that stage. Moshe Rabbeinu received in the end everything, he brought the people out. He, t- he brought them to the Torah. He, he did everything. But this urge to finish and fulfill my desire right now is actually n- it's detrimental to, to what, I, what I'm seeking. The world works in such a way that the more patience you have, the more the reward in the end. Or not the more the reward, but you can't even get the reward you wanted if you don't have the patience. So it's an essential character. Now, in, this, in today's Torah reading, the, the end of the Torah reading ends, Moshe ben Shmonim Shana, Aaron ben Shalosh Shmonim Shana, and Abraham el Paro. The Moshe was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Another interesting biographical point, <laughs> but what does it have to do with anything? Why do we need this? So, th- th- all kinds of different interpretations. There's a simple explanation according to Kabbalah, it's very, very simple, that 80 plus 83, how much is that together? 163. That's the value of two other sefirot, Netzach and Hod. Netzach is, we translate it usually as victory, and Hod is acknowledgement or thanksgiving. What does this have to do with anything? So this is, this is the other side. This is what f- completes the picture of what, it, what you need to have patience. To have patience, Yesod doesn't work by itself. In, in, the, in the body, it would be the procreative male organ plus the two testicles. It's like a, it's a triad that works together. So again, it's, it's just because people understand anatomy, you have to use some kind of, uh, some kind of image to, to, to understand why these things go together. 
but in in the inner meaning what it is is that victory and acknowledgement they represent what we call active um, confidence and passive confidence <coughs> in order to have patience a person has to has, have confidence what's the confidence the confidence is that this will be I, I have confidence in God that this will happen that's confidence and it's not just I have faith I have faith is amorphic it's abstract when I have faith I don't know exactly what I'm having faith in yet I just have faith that God is all good. But confidence is different because confidence, I have a picture of what I want. I have to have already a picture in my head of what I want to achieve. What is my self-fulfillment? Where am I going? Where, where, where do I think, we spoke yesterday about purpose, what do I think my purpose is? And so therefore, I live my whole life with confidence that I will achieve this purpose. Bitachon. Bitachon, exactly. So there's two sides to it. There's passive confidence, which is hod, and active confidence. What's the difference between them? Active confidence is that I have something I can do now actively to gain the fulfillment of my goal, of my purpose. There's something I can do right now, but I have to have confidence that I'll be able to do it. That, that what I'm going to do now is actually going to work. So that's the right side, that's victory. But sometimes there's nothing I can do, I'm just waiting. It says, even when you're waiting, you still have to have passive confidence. What is passive confidence? Passive confidence, the Rebbe used to describe this as, even though you're waiting, let's say it, this happened many times when people came to him, they were sick and they were waiting, wait, waiting to get better. The Rebbe promised me I would get better. So, it's like a promise, Hashem promised. So you don't like say, in the meantime, I'm sick. He says, no, in my passive confidence, even though there's nothing I can do right now, I'm waiting for the, for the medicine to work, whatever it is, I have a, an image of myself better already. Even though I can't do that, I can't make that. It's not active confidence, I have something to act. It's passive confidence. So I have an image in my head. This is what the uh, Chachamim say, that the Mashiach comes to those who wait for him. He says, what do you mean you wait? <laughs> you don't sit here and go like this, twiddle your thumbs. You wait means, like the Rebbe kept saying, that you have to imagine what it means that Mashiach will come. You, ha you have to keep thinking about it. So at, at the very end, in the final years, the Rebbe kept stressing that the best way, the, the easiest road to bring the Mashiach is to study the different issues of Mashiach and Geula, of Mashiach and the Redemption, <coughs> from the Torah. Because when you do that, your mind is now full with images of what will be. So, so there's understanding it the way, like the Rambam says, you can understand it very uh, figuratively with all the different midrashim, it'll be like this, like that. Or you can start learning Hasidut, and Hasidut unravels what the symbols mean. And so you have a better, me a better understanding what it means that Mashiach will come. But that is passive confidence, because you don't take the image of the goal out of your head. He says, that's, that's an important, uh, people give up because they don't have confidence in it. They think maybe my image, the image of what I want is not important. He says, no, that's exactly what the, the Avos, the patriarchs, they, they exercised their whole lives. There were things they could do, which wasn't very much because they were a small family and there were many, many Canaanites. But there was the constant passive confidence, which is to always still have the image of what I want. So... When I want my child to get married, I have to have a picture of him getting married in my head all the time. That's, it's based on what the Zohar says, that Hashem does to those who wait for Him. And specifically, that verse in Isaiah is talking about uh, Mashiach. But says the Zohar is 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 wisdom. So you have to have a wisdom to you that you keep having this image in you. This comes from the left side of the foundation, which is called Hod, what's the Sfirah that's to its left. So these three, they work together. You have patience because you are doing something. Either you're actually doing something to advance the cause, but, but that's active confidence. But a lot of times there's nothing you can do, like the patriarchs. So you're exercising your passive confidence, knowing that that picture is what you can do. So the Rebbe told people, why, I told you it would be well. Why, why are you walking around with a with a so, sorry face? If if you really believe me, 
then you should have con- if you have confidence in what I said, so you should have a picture of yourself well. <coughs> that's how you need to see yourself. If you see yourself this way, uh, that's, that's your contribution. Because it's like Hashem is saying, what, c- what can we contribute to the world? He says, we contribute how our mindset is. That's the, that's the greatest thing we control, that we always control. The, pr- the real battle today is not what happens on the outside. The real battle today is what happens in here. It's a question of whether I can continue to be confident and positive and optimistic and see my goal actually happening. Again, it could be it's going to take 20 years, I don't know. But that's, that. so, so the, the, this week's, um, this week's uh, Parsha is a lot about this, but the, the last verse of today's uh, Aliyah, today's reading, which is Exodus 7, 7, it's like the, 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 the it, it, it completes the second verse of the Parsha. And it tells us about Moshe and Aaron being Netzach and Hod, and this going together with the foundation, with the Yesod, that was at the beginning of the Parsha. And they, everything works. It's all Moshe and Aaron. Here you have to have both of them together, Moshe and Aaron together. Okay, so then we need to dive in. One question. Yeah. Um, so you said uh, the, the Moshe, the patriarchs, and what about Adam? Adam, in terms of. So Adam, he saw all the generations. He saw all the generations as they would unfold. And he, he was supposed to have the greatest patience. But when he ate from the tree of knowledge, it was being impulsive, impatient. It, it says that his eating from the tree of knowledge is like uh, sexual immorality. Because he acted impulsively. He couldn't hold back from trying to fulfill everything quickly. To have consciousness, to, to know something the way he wanted, was not just to know it, but to actually bring it about. That's what he wanted. But it didn't happen. It actually, he, he delayed it for thousands, of, for hundreds of generations. One thing, so in this teaching, we, need, we, ch- we have a, new, a different relationship and understanding of time. Right. Totally yeah. changes. This is all, so there's a lot more to say here about time because we didn't get into the right. <laughs> because time yeah. now becomes from beginning to the end of the task, not one hour to hour. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm-hmm.